The other day, I was talking with a friend of mine who is doing great work um, protecting wild places and wild beings and is because the whole political system is dreadful and because um, both Democrats and Republicans hate the natural world in their own way and neither one will really protect nature. For both of them, the economy is more important than the uh, natural world. This friend is, is thinking about running for public office and doing so um, not with the hope of winning, but with the hope of expanding discourse. And we were talking about some of this person's uh, positions that, 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 that she would take publicly. And one of the things we were talking about is how do you, how do you create incentives for protecting the natural world? And my responses to that, one of them was, well, because the entire economic system is based on subsidies, I would just, one of the things I would do is switch the subsidies around. So instead of subsidizing deforestation, you subsidize, you give, instead of giving corporations money to deforest, you give landowners money to, to allow the trees to stand. And you, you could incentivize um, endangered species protection by, if there are, if there's endangered species habitat and or endangered species on your land, you get some, you get benefits, you get, you get paid for that. Or, um, you know, if you, I mean, paying to, a great example of this is that the local national forest is actually pretty good. And one of the reasons it's pretty good is because they don't have a commercial timber sale program. So one of the things they do is they remove old mining roads, but that takes money. And so there are subsidies that go into that. And honestly, the, 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 the heavy equipment drivers don't care whether they're punching in a road or whether they're removing a road, they're getting paid to run their heavy equipment. And so, if I were in charge, one of the things I would do is just subsidize some of those good things as we would try to have a, you know, try to recognize that this way of living won't last and try to leave things in as good a shape as possible when the economy completely collapses. That's all, that's all fine. But then my friend said, so how would you, is there any way you could economically incentivize this without essentially using government funds? Is there any way you could incentivize banks or corporations or individuals to do this in a way that works within the economic system? And I said, absolutely not, because we have an insoluble problem, which is that money is made within the system through converting the living to the dead. A living forest is not worth anything. And the solution, by the way, we also talked about this. She said, what about um, the notion that's thrown out by a lot of people about how you can, um, how, how you, you have, you price in the ecosystem services. So you price in the clean water, you price in the, the you know, the, the value of a standing forest. And I said, well, there's a few problems with this. The first is it, if you actually price in the costs of, uh, the cost to nature of, of what you're doing, there is no economic activity that is financially viable, which means it's not gonna happen within the system because the system is based on privatizing profits and externalizing costs. And if you can't externalize the costs on the natural world, you won't make a profit, you won't privatize that profit. So, so it all basically comes down to naked power. How would you ever make this happen within this system? And it, it, you can't, that's one problem. Another problem is the presumption that you can, that capitalism or industrialism or any economic system can put an accurate value on 
what forests or seagrass beds or any other biome does. Well, if somebody paid you a trillion dollars for all of the phytoplankton in the world, you'll have a lot of money, but what are you going to breed? And so it's, it's, it's two incompatible systems, an economic system based on converting the living to the dead and an ecological community based on making natural communities stronger through evolutionary processes and through life processes. And the third problem is that this presumes that we don't actually care about those upon whom a value is, is put. And an example of this is I was doing a talk by Zoom through at Yale, I think it was, and uh, a lot of people were insisting that uh, protecting, that the only way to protect nature is to put a dollar value on it. And I was disagreeing and disagreeing and disagreeing. And we're going back and forth. And finally I said, you know, I actually agree with you. I agree that the only way to save nature is to put a value on it. And the same thing is true for human beings. And one of the people said, yeah, that's absolutely right. In fact, insurance companies do that all the time. They put a value, you know, if somebody dies, there's, there are charts of how much their, their life was worth. I said, well, yeah, I, I completely agree. And in fact, um, I've got some bad news and good news for you. And well, first, um, you're at an at a Ivy League school, so let's presume in your life you're going to make, say, $4 million. So the present value of this is $1 million. And he said, sure, that sounds fine for a number. And I said, okay, well, so I got bad news and good news. The bad news is that I'm going to kill you. The good news is that I way overpaid. I was talking to your parents, and um, I said that I would pay $5 million to kill you, and they did the math on the back of an envelope. And since your present value is only a million bucks, they were delighted. Um, and the, the point is that the same thing is true when you're talking about a forest. It's all well and good for somebody to say, well, they have overpaid for killing that forest, but that's because you're not the forest. And if you're the forest, or if you love the forest, or if the forest is your home, suddenly it's an entirely different thing. And so my, my friend and I went back and forth on this for probably an hour and a half, just trying to figure out what uh, ways that one could, within the system, incentivize financial institutions to do the right thing. And we would talk about them, and I kept coming back to the problem is you can't have an extractive system that is sustainable. You cannot have an extractive system that is sustainable. You cannot have an extractive system that is sustainable. And it is an insoluble problem to attempt to do so. And this is one of the problems with the whole bright green enterprise. This is, I'm not saying, by the way, that we can't do things to protect wild places and wild beings until the system collapses. I'm not saying that we can't attempt to steer the collapse to protect as much of wild nature as possible. What I'm saying is that cities are never sustainable. Industrial civilization is never sustainable. Civilization itself is never sustainable. They never have been. And attempting to protect wild nature through civilization is a good and great thing. Attempting to make protecting wild nature profitable as such is not possible. Attempting to make uh, civilization itself sustainable is not possible. I want to be really clear. I'm not saying that one can't turn specific nature helping actions into profitability. And the best example I can think of that is Asian carp are an exotic species, invasive species, really harming the Mississippi River. Well, I interviewed somebody about this several years ago, and it ends up that Asian carp taste really good. And you could temporarily make an industry of 
catching Asian carp, selling them, feeding people. There are specific, very specific small sectors of the economy that could be good for the planet and, um, and profitable. But those are very small, specific sectors. The economy as a whole, again, and even the Asian carp thing is still would be based on converting the living to the dead. It's just in this case, the living are harming the river. And so there are, but to get back to the point, it's, it's, like, it's like a friend of mine just recently, today actually, said to me that there is a difference between a predicament and a problem. And this friend's definition was that a predicament is not soluble, a problem you can solve. And one of the most important things for us to realize if we care about the natural world is that civilization itself has created an entire cascade of predicaments, not problems. <laughs>